IR practice prelim, electricity and ODU, section one, multiple choice. Question one. A train accelerates uniformly from five meters per second to 12 meters per second while traveling a distance of 119 meters along a straight to track. The acceleration of the track is, well, we know that U is equal to five meters per second, V is equal to 12.0 meters per second, and S is equal to 119 meters. A is what we want to find out. So this leads us to use the equation V squared is equal to U squared plus two A S. 12 squared is equal to 5 squared plus 2 times a times 119. 12 squared minus 5 squared over 2 times 119 is equal to a. a is equal to 0 0.5 meters per second per second, which is a. Question two, an object starts from rest and accelerates in a straight line. The graph show has the acceleration of the object varies with time. We need to find the time of the object of five seconds. So our basic equation here is V is equal to U plus A T. So let's go for the first part of the motion and that's from zero to three seconds. V is equal to our initial velocity, told it starts from rest 0 plus our acceleration, which is 4, times our time of 3 seconds, which gives us 12. Now in 3 to 5 seconds, that 12 becomes our initial velocity. So V is equal to 12 plus our acceleration, which is negative 2, multiplied by a time of 2 seconds, which is 12 minus 4, equal to 8 meters per second, which is B. A rocket of mass 200 kilograms accelerates vertically upwards from the surface of a planet at 2 meters per second per second. The gravitational field strength on the planet is 4 newtons per kilogram. What is the size of the force being exerted by the rocket's engines? So we're looking at a free body diagram here. 200 kilograms in any free body, we've got forces going up, forces going down, and our unbalanced force. We can calculate our unbalanced force here from mass times acceleration, which is 200 multiplied by two, giving us 400 newtons. Our downwards force is our weight, which is equal to mg, which is 200 times 4, giving 800 newtons. Now our force exerted by the engines has to be enough, first of all, to overcome the weight and then provide additional unbalanced force in order to cause acceleration. So our engine force is equal to our weight plus the unbalanced force, which is 800 plus 400 giving 1,200 newtons, C. Two blocks are linked by a Newton balance of negligible mass. The blocks are placed on a level frictionless surface. A force of 18 newtons is applied to the blocks as shown. Well, if we consider the whole system, the whole system has a mass of four plus six, which is 10 kilograms. The force acting on the full system is 18 newtons. That's our unbalanced force, because we're saying negligible friction, frictionless surface. So we can work out the acceleration of the system as being A is F over M. 18 divided by 10 gives us 1.8 meters per, sec per second. The tension on the Newton balance is equal to the force required to accelerate the 4 kilogram mass at the same rate as the whole system. So our acceleration is 1.8. The mass is 4 kilograms. 
applying Newton's second law, F equals MA, which is equal to four times 1.8, which is equal to 7.2 Newtons, A. Question five, uh, we have a block on a surface, 15 Newtons acts at an angle. Uh, we need to find which entry in the table shows the horizontal and vertical components of the force. Well, first of all, let's identify the angle. Uh, we're looking at 60 degrees here because that's the angle to the horizontal. For the horizontal component, we use Sokotoa, where we have the adjacent and the hypotenuse. So for the horizontal component, we have 15 cos, because of Sokotoa, 15 cos of 60, which means it must be D or E. And for the vertical component, we're looking at the opposite and the hypotenuse. So that's so. So that's 15 sine 60, giving us E. Question six, diagram shows the masses and velocities of two trolleys just before they collide on a level bench. After the collision, the trolleys move along the bench and join together. How much kinetic energy is lost in the collision? So we need to work out how much kinetic energy we had before and how much kinetic energy we have after. In order to do this, we need to know the velocities of the trolley after they connect. So before the collision, we have two masses, uh, one with a mass of one, the other one with a mass of two. And then after the collision, they're combined with each other to give us a total mass of three. Our velocity of the first mass is six meters per second. And for the second mass, it's zero. Momentum is always conserved. So the momentum before is equal to momentum after. The momentum before MV is equal to mass times velocity, one times six which is six kilograms meters per second. And that's equal to MV, where our mass is three. V is what we want to find out. So V is equal to six divided by three, which is two meters per second. We can now work out the kinetic energy systems before and after. Kinetic energy before is Ek equals one half mg squared, half times one times six squared, which is 36. Half of 36 is 18 joules. Kinetic energy after, same equation, this time with a mass of three and a velocity of two. So 2 squared is 4, times 3 is 12, half is 6. So the difference between 18 and 6 is 12 joules, which is C. Question 7, we have a force time graph, uh, mass of 5 kilograms. And we need to calculate the change in momentum of the object. Well, the change in momentum, delta mv, is mv minus m u, which is equal to ft. So ft equals mv minus mu, but it's also equal to the area under the ft graph. So let's split our graph into areas 1, 2, and 3. Area 1 is the space times height, so 1 times 10. Area two is a triangle. So our area is half of base times height. So it's a half multiplied by base, which is one, multiplied by our height. Difference between 10 and 20 is 10. And area three, again, is a triangle. So it's half of base times height. Base is between one and three, so that's two. The height is between 1 and 0 and 20, so that's 20. And then all we need to do is add up these areas. So let's work them out individually. That's 10. That's 5. 
that's 20. So our total area is 10 plus 5 plus 20, which is equal to 35 Newton seconds, which is the same as 35 kilograms meters per second. So that's C. Question 8, uh, gravitation question. Satellite orbits a planet at a distance of 5 times 10 to the 7 uh, meters, or R equals 5.0 times 10 to the 7. We have two masses, mass 1, mass of the satellite, which is 2.5 times 10 to the 4 kilograms. Mass 2, which has a mass of 4 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, that's our planet. And we can find G from the data table at 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. So our equation here is F is equal to G M1 M2 over R squared. So 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 multiplied by 2.5 times 10 to the 4 multiplied by 4 times 10 to the 24 all over 5 times 10 to the 7 all squared. And that's the most common mistake made. People forget to square the radius. If you do all of the calculations, applying into the formula, we end up with a value of 2.7 times 10 to the 3, which is B. Question 9. Length of a spaceship at rest is L. The spaceship passes a planet at a speed of 0.95 C. Which row in the table gives the measured length of the spaceship according to the observer on the spaceship and the observer on the planet? Okay, so the length of the spaceship at rest is L. So that's going to be the length that the observer that's moving with the ship is going to measure. So the measured lengths of the spaceship according to the observer on the spaceship, they're going to notice L. So that gives us A or B. To the observer on the planet, because we're at 0.95 C, we're going to see relativistic effects which means time dilation and length contraction. So they're going to have less than L. So our answer is B. Question 10, spaceship is moving with a constant speed of 0.6 C towards the Earth. The spaceship emits a beam of light towards the Earth. An astronaut on the spaceship and an observer on Earth both measure the speed of the emitted light. Which row in the table shows the speed of the emitted light as measured by the astronaut and by the observer on Earth. So this is kind of a trick question here. Um, at 0.6c, yes, we'd expect relativistic effects. However, the special theory of relativity stands on the premise that the speed of light is constant no matter whether you're traveling close to the speed of light or not. So it's going to be B. Both the observer and the person, the spaceship traveling close to the speed of light measure the speed of light to be the same. 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Spacecraft travels at a constant speed of 0.7 C relative to Earth. A clock on the spacecraft records a flight time of three hours. A clock on Earth records this time to be. Well, we have relativistic effects happening because we're above 0.1 C. Uh, the time on Earth is going to appear to be longer. So we use the equation for time dilation. T dash is equal to T over the square root of 1 minus v over c all squared. t is the time on the spacecraft, which is 3 hours. And v over c is 0 0.7. So we just square that. So we're expecting an answer for t dash to be longer. So we can automatically get rid of a and get rid of b. So C, D, or E are going to be our options. Plug in the values into the equation, and you get C, 4.2 hours. An astronomer observes a spectrum of light from a star. The spectrum contains emission lines for hydrogen. The astronomer compares the spectrum with the spectrum from a hydrogen lamp. The line which has a wavelength of 656 nanometers from the lamp is found to be shifted to 663 nanometers in the spectrum from the star. 
calculate the redshift of the light from the star. So we're expecting a positive number. Our equation for redshift, z is equal to lambda naught minus lambda r over lambda r. So the observed is 663, take away 656 over 656, which gives you a value of 0 0.011, which is A. Question 13, galaxies moving away from the Earth at a velocity of 1.2 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Light of wavelength 450 nanometers is emitted from the galaxy. When detected and measured on Earth, this light has a wavelength of... Okay, so we need to use two equations here. First of all, we use Z equals V over C um, in order to determine the redshift. So that is 1.2 times 10 to the 7 divided by 3 times 10 to the 8. That gives a value of redshift to be 0 0.04. We then apply that equation to z is equal to lambda naught minus lambda r over lambda r. But actually, the easier form to use, this is the one that's on the relationship sheet, we can use z equals lambda naught over lambda r take away 1. So 0 0.04 is equal to lambda naught, that's the, the wavelength observed, over the wavelength at rest, which is 450 nanometers, because light of wavelength 450 nanometer is emitted from the galaxy. So that is the wavelength at rest, minus 1. So 1.04 is equal to lambda naught over 450. Lambda is equal to 1.04 multiplied by 450, giving the value greater than 450, which is what we expect. And we actually end up with 468 nanometers. Question 14. Galaxies at different distances from Earth have been found to have different speeds. The graph shows the data for the distance galaxies. This is our Hubble graph. Uh, students studied this graph and makes the following statements. The speed of distance galaxies varies inversely with their distance from Earth. That is false, because we can see as the distance increases, the speed increases also. The gradient of line gives the value of Hubble's constant. Yes, it does. And the unit for Hubble's constant is s to the minus 1. Yes, it is. And we can check that against the data. Data sheet to print the paper, giving a statement 2 and statement 3 only. Train is traveling at a constant speed of 16 meters per second as it approaches a bridge. A horn on the train emits a sound of 277 hertz. That's the frequency of our source. Uh, the sound is heard by a person standing on the bridge. The speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second. You need to find the frequency of the sound heard by the person on the bridge. So remember, meow, Dopplers. So we expect the frequency of the sound heard by the observer to be higher than that of the source. So we're going towards, so we take away. Our equation for Doppler is our observed frequency is equal to the frequency of the source multiplied by V over V minus Vs. So 277 multiplied by 340 over 340 take away because it's towards 16, which gives us a value of C, 291 Hertz. Question 16, cooling of the universe and cosmic microwave background radiation provide evidence for the Big Bang, D. Question 17, we see a Planck distribution. A student makes the following statements based on the information shown in the graph. Uh, as the temperature of the object increases, the total energy emitted per second decreases. Uh, now we don't see that. We can see that the peaks are getting higher at the different temperatures. Statement's false. 
as the temperature of the object increases, the peak wavelength of the emitted radiation decreases. We see that, yes, wavelengths going down, follow the peaks. And third one, a little bit more difficult, frequency of the emitted radiation steadily increases as the emitted energy per second decreases. Okay, so as this emitted energy per second decreases, we can see the wavelength is going up. Now, if the wavelength is going up, that means the frequency is going to decrease. So statement three is incorrect. So statement two only, that is B. A crystal of silicon is doped with arsenic. This means that a small number of silicon atoms are replaced by arsenic atoms. The effect of doping on the crystal is to decrease its resistance because we're increasing its conductivity. Question 19, uh, we're looking at an oscilloscope trace for an AC source. We're given the time-based setting of 30 milliseconds per division. So watch out for the milliseconds because that's 30 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds. We need to find the frequency of the output signal from the signal generator. Well, we can see we have four divisions for one complete wave. So T is equal to 4 times 30 times 10 to the negative 3, which is 120 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds. Uh, frequency is 1 over the period. So 1 over 120 times 10 to the negative 3, uh, which is equal to B. Uh, 8.3 times 10 to the negative 3 hertz. Uh, question 20, we have resistors in combination and we need to find the resistance between X and Y. Well, in series, the rule is RT equals R1 plus R2. So actually we can reduce this circuit because these two combine, these two combine. And we end up with a 20 ohm resistor in parallel with a 10 ohm resistor in parallel with another 20 ohm resistor. RT 1 over is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. You can stick this into the fraction uh, function on your calculator, but the math is actually quite straightforward. You need to get a common denominator. So we end up 1 over 20 plus 2 over 20 plus 1 over 20, giving us a total of 4 over 20. Remember to flip. So RT is equal to 20 over 4, which is 5 ohms. And we expect to have a resistance less than 10, because when we combine resistance in parallel, the total resistance is always less than the lowest value of resistance. Uh, question 21, we have a Wheatstone bridge configuration, and we need to find the reading on the voltmeter. You can do this using proportions. Now, so V1 over V2 is equal to R1 over R2. Or you can do uh, V2 is equal to R2 over R1 plus R2 multiplied by Vs, which is the potential divided equation. Now, you need to do this on either side of the bridge and then find the potential values and compare them. So on the left-hand side of the bridge here, we have a 6 and a 6, which means our voltage of 12 volts is going to be split evenly. So the potential here is going to be 6 volts. The potential across the 4 ohm resistor, well, we look at the proportions here. The voltage over the 4 ohm resistor is going to be twice as high as it is for the 2 ohm resistor. Both of them have to add up to 12 volts. So that's going to end up being 8 volts. The difference between 6 and 8 is B, 2 volts. The capacitance of the capacitor is 1,000 microfarads. Potential difference across the capacitor is 100 volts. The charge stored by the capacitor is 0.1 coulombs. Uh, the charge in the capacitor is now reduced, which means we're going to reduce the amount of energy stored in the capacitor. Uh, which row in the table shows the capacitance of the capacitor and the potential difference across the capacitor for this new value of charge? Well, the capacitance of the capacitor is not affected by the amount of charge it stores. 
Uh, so that's going to have to be A, C, or E. So D and B are definitely incorrect. Now, if we're storing half the amount of charge, then that means we have half the amount of energy. Therefore, the potential difference is going to be half of the original value. So that's going to be 50 volts. So that means E is our answer. In question 23, we're asked to find the potential difference across the 12 ohm resistor when the switch is closed and when the switch is not closed. Well, when the switch is opened, we have a 6 and a 12 resistance in series. Now, we could work out the current using I equals Vs over RT, but this is in the multiple choice. It's not expecting you to do a huge amount of calculation. You should be able to do this mentally. If we just have 6 and 12 in series, that means my 6 ohm resistor is going to receive half of the voltage of the 12 ohm resistor. 12 ohm resistor here is going to get 12 18ths of the total resistance, twice as much voltage as the 6, which means that's going to be 60 volts. So we can get rid of A, we can get rid of B, we can get rid of E. When the switch is closed, the 6 and the 6 combine, so we end up with a total of 3 ohms. So now the 12 ohm resistor is going to get 12 fifteenths of the total voltage, which is going to be the large part, which is 72. So D is our answer. As I said, you can work this out using Ohm's law. You can work it out using the potential divided equation as well. V2 is equal to R2 over R1 plus R2 multiplied by Vs. It always encourages you to use common sense and try and use mental maths as well. Question 24, student makes the following statements about PN junctions. In solar cells, a potential difference is produced when photons are instanced on the junction. Yes. Photovoltaic effect occurs in solar cells. Yes. In LEDs, light emitting diodes, photons are emitted from the junction when the currents pass through. Yes. Statements 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so question 25, our last question is an internal resistance question. Classic internal resistance setup, uh, we're measuring the TPD uh, with different values of the load resistance. We have our TPD and current graph, and we need to determine values for EMF and internal resistance. Well, the normal way to determine the EMF from a TPD current graph is to extend the graph back. Now, obviously, we don't have that scale there, but we know that the EMF is going to be more than 6. So A and B are definitely incorrect. In terms of finding the internal resistance, we could choose values and apply the equation E is equal to V plus IR. Uh, but the most simple method is by working out the gradient, because we know that the resistance is equal to the negative gradient. So that means resistance is equal to negative of y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Two easy points we can choose. So that is going to be 0 minus 6 over 3 minus 1. Remember, this is all negative. So minus minus 2 gives you 2 ohms, which means our answer is C, and that's us. The section two questions are split into two videos, so make sure to watch part one and also part two.